even as the world falls down around them, they've got to get that last drink. What about you, Nick? Uh, well, know? I think, uh, you know, Andy is a bit of a tight ass, but he's he's been wronged, you know, and and he's completely in the right. You know, he's a 41, 40... Wow, is he? he is. <laughs> he's a 40-something old man, and he's a, you know, he's a professional, he has a business, and it's... Why should he let him get away with it? You know, he's... And no one else says anything. I think that's what infuriates Andy. It's like, why am I the only one on him all the time? You know, Edgar's one of Edgar's notes on set all the time was, yeah, you can't be on him all the time. Anything he says, cut him down, you know. And it was, it was great. It was great to be able to do that, you know. You know, he's, he's a gentle man, but he's, he, he, has, he has beef. He has beef. You get me blood. <laughs> one last thing for me, and then I want to hear what you guys want to know. I love, and I told you this when I met you the other day, I love all the shots of the close-ups of the, of the draft and the close-ups of the water. How hard is it to get the camera that close to, because you must have been a large camera, that close to the drink apparatus? Oh, yeah. you, you do those things that they have in beer. I mean, I, I feel like I could shoot a beer advert uh, right here for myself. I tried to do some of the logos upside down, like Foster's, which is like a not particularly great brand, but one of the few brands to their credit said yes. In this, Budweiser said no to being in the film, they said, uh, we're uncomfortable with the levels of drunkenness. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Only because you can't get that drunk on Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> I had these like, Foster's pumps, I was thinking, oh, how do I shoot that without shoot? I think I'll shoot the Foster's logo upside down. So it looks like an upside down crucifix or something. So I thought if I do these product placement shots, I kind of like switch them upside down. But they have these things, uh, like these periscope lenses. It's like a sort of a, a lens that comes out and down so you can put it into a glass and stuff. So I could shoot. Listen, if there's any uh, ad reps there, I'll happily shoot the Budweiser campaign for the next Super Bowl. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's interesting doing those things because you do have to make it, you know, it was fun sort of trying to figure out how to do, make a water pouring shot for him. Listen, I do see your agent in the in the theater. I'm sure you have a conversation with him, make, make something happen. Okay, I want to know what you all want to know. Question right here. Um, what's the case head with the model modeled after Simon? It is. Yeah. Was the, the question is, was the model of kings the king's head modeled after Simon? And the pub that was is was the king's head is called the Arena Tavern in Letchworth in Hertfordshire in the UK. And they've decided to change their name to the King's Head Tavern from the Arena Tavern and keep the sign, which is a picture of me. Which is like, one of the best things ever. Uh, two best things ever, that. And also tonight, when we were doing, uh, during the scene when we're all showing each other scars, when Nick uh, does the thing about we played the Aliens game, was reaching over to Bill Paxman going, huh? <laughs> Too many film references in this one. There's only really two. The, the oh man, they mentioned this thing, and like the knife game. And I said, what are the chances that Bill Paxton is in the house tonight? <laughs> <laughs> like the one reference we make to a movie. But thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> what else? What else? Right here in the front. Uh, how do you get the idea for the whole blanks concept? Where did the idea for the blanks come from? I like this idea. I'm always like sort of like in 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 uh, like sort of TV and film. There's lots of kind of great like I always find and androids and replicants pretty scary. <coughs> whether it's the Autons from Doctor Who or like um, you know the Stepford Wives or um, uh, Ian Holm and Alien. But I sort of had this idea that like that um, when I used to play with action figures as a kid, I used to have like the. Um, you, UK version of G.I. Joe is called Action Man. Do you know Action Man over here? Yeah. 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 So, like, you could easily twist the heads off and easily, like, pull the arms out. And so I don't know why, but I would always, like, sort of half destroy my toys, and then I had a lot of, like, a, a lot of, like, dismembered soldiers and stuff. So I always thought that was just an interesting image. I wanted, like we said about the kind of, almost like the booze and, like, being around Gary is going to regress all the others to being children. So I wanted the kind of the blanks to feel like kind of they were fighting dolls, you know? And then the thing with the blue gloop inside is like there were a couple of reasons for that. We wanted to do something like a different color because like everybody does green blood for aliens. We didn't want to do that. Um, and uh, but uh, two things is that we like the idea of them at you know, one point they're called blue people. Blanks see themselves as a better class of, of uh, humanoids. 
And then the other thing was like, so as a way of regressing the actors, I was like, when I went, was in school, I used to draw a lot and write with a, like a fountain pen, and I'd get just like blue ink all over my hands all the time, and then I'd wipe it on my face by accident. So I remember going home every day from school with like inky hands, inky shirt, inky face. And I thought that would be a great way that after that first fight, all of the actors look like little kids again. So that was the idea. Also, we wanted them but to be it like... like it would be fun to twist those heads off? Yeah. We wanted them to be not entirely well put together. The idea is that the network, whoever these are, you know, they don't look like that. They just make versions of whoever's on the planet to spread their word. They just usually drop a bunch of these off. They start telling the rest of the citizens of the planet about their you know, ideologies, and gradually over a few hundred years it spreads, and they become peaceful, they move on. They've never ever come across such a bunch of assholes as us. <laughs> <laughs> they never really built them that strong because they never had to contend with anyone as belligerent and argumentative and annoying as human beings, which is why they kind of pop apart like that. They should have made them stronger. <laughs> I think one of my notes to the, make, the, the makeup guys when we were designing them said, you know, we're talking about what they should look like. And they said, imagine if you, like, punched an Easter egg. Mm. Like, your fist would go right down. <laughs> I've never done that, but I've often thought about doing it. <laughs> Those things hurt to punch as well. <laughs> uh, no, well, I mean, Easter eggs hurt to punch too, but the blanks, you know, I had to punch that girl's stomach and uh, a couple of heads too, and that didn't really hurt. They were really quite thick. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the end of that story. <laughs> Did you ever think you'd say in a movie, I just punched my wedding ring out of a robot's tummy? <laughs> it was a lovely lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, was yeah. We were very pleased the day we came up with that one. And, uh, why don't you get back in your rocket and fuck off to Legoland, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> There is nothing gratuitous about this. <laughs> this man is a fan. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm a big fan of the Sisters of Mercy, so much so that I believe that this corrosion is actually late Sisters of Mercy. It's second generation Sisters when he reformed with Patricia from the yeah. Gun Club. The 85 version of the Sisters, first and last and always, uh, when it was Gary Marks and Wayne Hussey and Andy Eldridge, they, for me, are the pure Sisters of Mercy. Uh, my favorite band as a, an 18 year old girl. Why don't you get a room? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're too young to like Sisters of Mercy, shut up. <laughs> Some young indie kid with a trendy t shirt you bought from fucking Gap. <laughs> I'm kidding, I love you. <laughs> Who's the House uh, Martins fan? Uh, we both like the House Martins, yeah. That was, I mean, it's one of those songs we always like to do something, especially in Sean and this one. Like uh, after a really intense like scene, is find the most like joyously upbeat song you could possibly have. So happy hour by the house mind seemed like the best bet for that one. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, ready? Yes. Yeah, I'm pointing at you. Yes, you just pointed at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> was the plan from the very beginning to always have that really crazy ending? Like, was it always envisioned to wind up in this post-apocalyptic? Yeah, we, we wanted that idea. We didn't want to skimp out on the title, and we wanted to do something where it was the epilogue. We wanted to make it quite novelistic in a way that, like, you know, it is the epilogue, and like Simon narrates the prologue, and Nick narrates the epilogue. And the idea that what it's leading up to is that, like, all the way through the film, it seems like Gary King is the only person who thinks back about that night and it being fun, and the others don't really care anymore. And then, right at the very end, like, the, the Nick's character like, admits that he misses him and he thinks about those days. So it's really just having this kind of wraparound thing that it had to, it had to go that bad, it had to go that bad. <laughs> the world had to end for them to get to this point where they'd actually apologize. Uh, apologize I think the thing, the thing that we, the, the idea that we had, we wanted in the same way that we always had the idea of Ed in the shed with Sean at the end of Sean of the Dead was that Gary should end up with his younger friends. Gary should end up with him and the younger versions of his friends. And we toyed with the idea of time travel. We thought maybe when the world ends, there's some sort of warp that happens and they go through it and Gary gets sucked back in time and he goes back to the night in 1990, and, you know, but it, it, which felt poetic, but it was too complicated and time travel throws up a lot of problems with logic. <laughs> which is how we, we, how we came up with the idea for the blanks, really, in the fact that they can regenerate you at any age and they can create whatever version of you that they like. And um, offer you, like, your young offer you your youth, you know, as if they start bargaining with people, if they start to kind of you know, debate with the human race or whatever. So that's how Gary, uh, we got Gary to end up with his young friends, was that he, in the end, he is with the blank versions. He can play with his robot friends forever. <laughs> <laughs> right here with the Richard. Oh, um, what was it like putting together the fight scenes and really kind of making these guys that are kind of nobodies, you know? Like, how, how did you decide who's going to be what? And, um, you know, like how, you know, he's super proficient at kicking ass, but... <laughs> 
right? <laughs> <laughs> it's pub food. <laughs> yeah, we thought that there's a couple of things. It's like in terms of what, within the film, we thought it'd be funny that the, that Dutch courage takes over. Like we thought that, like we try sort of, you know, you see in the prologue that like the uh, Nick's character is like plays rugby and is like a brawler, and so like he might not have had a fight for a long time, but he's quite, as the Brits would say, tasty. Um, and then like I, I think the others have like sort of like Dutch courage just takes over, and and what we liked within the fights is that. It's, the, it's not that they're all doing martial arts, it's like this mix of like rugby moves and WrestleMania moves. <laughs> <laughs> you might have spotted the people's elbow in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the tombstone in there as well. <laughs> we just thought that maybe they'd like remembered a lot of WrestleMania moves when they were younger. But I like the idea that it's just the sort of like, there was, that, there was that thing that we talked about, there's that Jackie Chan film, Drunken Master, where Jackie can't fight until he's drunk. And we thought about that in terms of, terms of Dutch courage, is that in that way that you do a lot of stupid things when you're drunk that you wouldn't even think about doing until you're sort of licking up. But in terms of then designing the fights, what was really good fun is we worked with this great stunt choreographer called Brad Allen who did Scott Pilgrim's fights in unbroken takes. How can we do them for as long as possible without cutting? And that's really down to the fact that these guys and Paddy and Martin Freeman and uh, Ross Pike can actually really do the moves and the choreography so what they do is they do sort of an evaluation with the actors, work out what everybody can do, and as it turns out, quite a lot, because there's hardly any doubling. Like that bathroom scene that you see, there's only like three shots in that scene with stunt doubles. Um, and then the other thing in that fight scene, you may or may not have noticed, and I think I talked about this in the EW panel the other day, is that all of the kids in that scene are, are the stuntmen. Like there are no stunt doubles in that scene. So those kind of like um, five kids that they beat up were stuntmen, stunt boys, from like from the ages of 15 to like 19. The main kid, the guy Greg, the first one he gets decapitated, um, he, he was 15 and turned 16 on the set. And like three years ago, he was Chloe Moretz's stunt double in Kick Ass. And he was like a 12 year old boy playing Kick Girl. Yeah, they had his stunt bits for that. like a yammer cut of bees. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we've got time for one more question. Who really, really wants it? Okay, you're waiting in the hard, yeah. I know it was uh, to originally took place in a different town, but uh, why not include the Winchester in the Golden Mile? Um, why was the Winchester not in the Golden Mile? It was never supposed to be in the Golden Mile. I'll film. fill this one. We, <laughs> we decided uh, that the, when we wrote the film, we sort of decided what was going to happen in each pub, and then we went back and we named each pub specifically to correspond with what goes on inside. So the first post is the first post they go into. The old familiar looks the same as the first post. The famous cock is where Gary is famous. He's a bit of a cock. He got barred from it. They chuck him out. The cross hands are their, their first fight. The cross hands. The good companions are they're pretending to be friends. You see the sign. It's like four unhappy faces and one happy face. That's the boys and Gary. Uh, the trusty servant is the Reverend Green, who you know is collaborating with the blanks. The mermaid is the marmalade sandwich. Uh, no, the two-headed the two dog. The two-headed dog is the twin. Sorry, the mermaid is the marmalade sandwich. Sandwich. Uh, the king's head. The beehive. The beehive. Sorry. Of, it's, it's uh, uh, like the drones in industry. Yeah. The bee. The king's head is Gary's brain. That's where he kind of like decides to complete the call. The hole in the wall is because Stephen drives through the wall in the car. And the world's unexplained itself. Uh, In that whole of the prologue, it basically prefigures the entire movie, even to the point where, like, this is where Mind Freeman's going to come out, this is where Eddie Marzan's going to come out, this is how, where they're going to end up. So we sort of tried to do a thing that the, the first three minutes of the movie basically tells you everything. What uh, happens. I say at the beginning that O-Man, uh, Martin's character, was basically all mad. You can think about what he looks like at the end. Yeah. There's lots, we, we like to put loads of those things in, like all the three, the, you know, the fact that there's five musketeers, Oh, it would be more exciting with five because then two could have died. Two could die and still have three left. So we sort of like, there's a lot of like setup stuff. We like to do these little, which is big show offs. <laughs> well, you can all see it again on August 23rd when it comes out in theater. Tell all your <laughs> <laughs>